Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's good to be with you. I hope that you are all well and coping okay with everything that's going on. And we find ourselves somewhat by surprise, I think, if you're like me, here on Palm Sunday. Where did Lent go? I haven't the faintest idea where the rest of Lent seems to have disappeared, but uh, we live in extraordinary times. We have to expect these things. So we have this story of Jesus arriving in Jerusalem, riding into the city on a donkey. Well, I hope you've got a beautiful picture of a cute donkey come up on the screen in front of you. Uh, this picture always makes me laugh, so I thought I'd share it with you. It's a bit of fun this morning. But riding on a donkey, does that not sound like fun? Hands up if you've ever ridden a donkey on a beach or even ridden in a donkey derby. Um, you'll know how frustrating donkeys can be, I suspect, if you have. But today we celebrate Jesus at the Passover festival. Jesus standing on the cusp of all that's going to happen, the events that lead to his trial, his crucifixion and his death. And we have to go through all of that before we can celebrate the resurrection next week. So in some ways it seems like an odd thing to do to celebrate on this day. But of course, the Jews were crowding into Jerusalem from all over the Roman world to celebrate the Passover festival. It was one of the biggest Jewish festivals and it was how he celebrated God freeing them from Egypt and from Pharaoh all those generations back. So it was a big deal and it was a big celebration. But when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he knows that he's in danger. He knows that he comes uh, putting himself at risk. But rather than sneaking in under the uh, cover of darkness or rather than just keeping his head down and hiding in the crowds, the massive crowds of people, he seems to be almost uh, sh allowing this show of uh, of loyalty and not real loyalty I'm guessing on most behalf of most of the people there they were just hyped up by the crowd shouting and cheering and having a, a, a good time but he seems to be drawing attention to himself guaranteeing the anger of the Jewish authorities and the suspicion of those in authority uh, from Rome so why why would he do that well, I think at least in part, it's because his, he knew his ministry had to come to an end. There had to be an end to what he was doing, to this phase, uh, in order to bring in the next phase, that which we know as church, so that the movement would continue. It didn't just fade away with Jesus. If Jesus had died a natural death and that had been the end of it, would we still uh, know about him today? I kind of doubt that. So he knew that the time had come for the final round in the match between him and the authorities. It's overdue. It's not overdue, but it's due. It's time. Time for that to happen. And yet at the same time as drawing the crowd, at the same time as allowing the crowd to shout and cheer and all the rest of it, he arrives in the deepest humility by choosing to come on a donkey. As in all things, this strange decision was calculated and deliberate. The preparations were evidently made in advance. It's quite clear from reading the account that it wasn't a spur of the moment decision. He'd made the arrangements beforehand. And Matthew tells us why by quoting from Zechariah 9 in the Old Testament. See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We're probably fairly familiar with those words, but less familiar with the words that follow. Let me just read some of those for you. Zechariah goes on to say that God says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He, the one who comes on the donkey, will proclaim peace to the nations his rule will extend from sea to sea and then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. The Lord, their God, will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. What a wonderful way of summing up all that Jesus promises us through his death and resurrection. 
The Jewish leaders knew their scripture. They would have known the significance of the riding in on the donkey had they not been so enraged with Jesus for defiling their holy festival. Jesus comes in peace. He comes to defeat evil and injustice. He comes to sweep away death, but in humility and love. And there is nothing more humbling than the sight of a grown man riding a donkey. Today being Palm Sunday, it's normally a day when you'd expect to leave the church with your palm cross. No palm crosses this year. But if you go on to YouTube and you type in something like paper palm cross instructions or how to make a paper palm cross, you will find instructions as to how to do it. And if I can do it, you can do it. I made this earlier on. It's uh, very, very simple. And the thing about this is that this year, your palm cross is going to be totally personal to you because you can decorate it in whatever way you like. You can choose the colour of paper you use. This was made from a strip from an a, the, long, the long side of an A4 piece of paper. So you can have your palm cross, but you're going to have to make it yourself this year. Uh, but it will be unique to you. So enjoy doing that. Get creative. Matthew records people pulling branches from the trees. It's only John's gospel in which we hear the word palm specifically mentioned, uh, but he's talking about them pulling down branches, throwing down their cloaks, so that even the donkey that Jesus is riding on won't have to touch the dirty, dusty road. It's a bit like rolling out a red carpet. It's the same, same idea, really. So we have our palms but not just palm leaves, palm leaves made into the shape of the cross, because that has a deeper significance to us than anything else that happened on that day. We are looking ahead to what is about to happen. And the humility and love that brought Jesus into Jerusalem on a donkey continues through the narrative, continues on through the events of that following week, right to the cross, where it is ultimately displayed. Jesus was humble enough to endure his trusted companion betraying him, his friends deserting him, his bestie denying him, his leaders ridiculing him and the government failing to protect him. He was humble enough to endure a severe flogging, the walk of shame to the execution site, the nails, the suffocation, the pain, and the death of the cross. The days that follow Palm Sunday were eventful and shocking, even when I've said all that as quickly as I did. But I don't invite you to gloss over it this week. I invite you to walk through it this week. If you've got any books or other resources that help you to focus on the events of Holy Week, dig them out and use them. I'm hoping to get some um, reflections on the website, on the church website that I used uh, a couple of years ago. Um, they might be useful if they are, they're there for you. But don't be tempted to skip from the celebration of Palm Sunday to the celebration of Easter Sunday without the bit in between, however tempting it may be. The humility and love of Jesus is starkly laid out in the Gospels. He lived a selfless, obedient life, then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Read that passage to yourself every day this week. And when you get to next Sunday, you can read the next two verses as well, but hold off for that for this week because they show us just how we should be living our lives and just how Jesus lived his. And so I want us to pray through those words this morning. I'm hoping that each individual phrase will appear on the screen for you. And uh, as you read those through for your, wrote words through for yourselves, let them sink in, think about what they mean. I'll offer uh, one or two words that may help you to do that. Uh, but we're really just focusing on God's word from Philippians. So 
So the first phrase. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. So think about how Jesus thought of himself according to this passage. And the next phrase, he had equal status with God. Equal status with God. And the next bit, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. Next phrase, when the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity. He chose to set aside the privileges of deity. And he took on the status of a slave, becoming human. Having become human, he stayed human. Human. 